Hmm. Is that true or false? Yes. You're not very square. <laughs> it's a true statement. Sex is the medium by which life is created. Procreation. Food is the means by which life is what? Preserved. Did you know the first two commandments that God gave to Adam and Eve in Genesis 1, 28 and 29 revolved around sex and food. He said to them, go and multiply and do what? Fill the earth and subdue it. In Genesis 1, 28 he said, I have given to you every plant that yields seed for food. Hmm. That's the first commandment that God gave. Did you know something else? That sex and food rank among humans' most pleasurable experiences. If you are to look at the most pleasurable human experiences, the first one would be sex for many, the rest of it, most of us love to eat food. <laughs> it's one of our most pleasurable experiences. Worship is another. And ask myself, why did God make them that way? Why? Because our very existence as a species is dependent on those two. The sad news is this. What God gave to us as a blessing, the devil has taken it around mm. and used it as a curse on ourselves. Oh yes. oh yes. That's why in many communities today, we have food, but instead of food being a blessing, it has become a curse. Obesity, food-related lifestyles, sex has become an object of abuse in many war zones, that which God gave to us as a blessing, the devil has taken and turned it around and made it as a curse. What am I saying? Children receive life from their parents. Yesterday I made a statement, the life that you and me receive from our parents, how much did we contribute to that life? 1% or 0%? 0%. But I want you to catch this. The continuation of that life that you have received without any contribution, the prosperity of that life is dependent on what you do with it. Your parents give you life. If that life is to prosper and continue, its prosperity and continuation is dependent on how you grow it. For the fact be told, if you do not grow the life you have received, what is the sure end? Then. Now yesterday I showed you the picture of our children. We have two daughters, Helen and Eunice. Now, one of the greatest challenges I faced, or we faced as a parent, is getting Helen to love food. You know, the kids who just don't like food. Yes. And it so happened that her dislike of food developed from when she was an infant. Every time she would breastfeed, she would have pains in the tummy. And mothers know about it. I remember I was a student at New at uh, uh, Baraton and I would wake up three or four times in the night to try and give her great water to try and ease the pain. It never helped. And so she associated food with what? Pain. In less than six months, she refused to breastfeed. And after that, food was a struggle. I remember even when we went to the UK, I would spend two hours pleading with this kid, please eat. And she would put food in her mouth, and you know, you would try to sing songs so that every time she opens her mouth and says something, some food goes in. <laughs> There are times I would wish, Lord, how can I get the food right into the stomach? Why was I, as a parent, very concerned about her loving food? Because I know that if she doesn't love food, her life is doomed. And hear my statement. I received life 
in order to preserve it and prosper it, disciples must grow the life of Jesus that they receive through the Holy Spirit if that life is to be preserved and to prosper. So my message today is a simple message. As a disciple of Jesus, if you do not grow into the life of Christ, mm. there is only one sure end. You remain a dead disciple waiting to be buried. Shame. Shame. So the question we want to ask is this. What does it take to grow into the life of Christ? And if you have noticed from my messages, I like to use what you know to get you to what you need to know. And so I will try to answer it from a very particular or from a very simple lesson. What does it take to grow the life that we receive from our parents? Number one, you can switch this one off. What does it take? Do you have do we have a baby here? Yes. Excuse me, sir. Our brother there. What is this young man called? Come. <coughs> David, come. <coughs> Can you stand next to this, my friend? <laughs> All of us one day were at this young man, isn't it? Yes. We were this size. Yes. What did we do to get from here to here? <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> There's a saying in my community, and some of you may know it, let me say, in, the, in actual language, it says, Mere the Akona bow. Bodies are not built of brick, hay, or stone. What are they built with? Food. When you see a big body, it takes what? Great food to build it. <laughs> so when you see David like that, you know, he hasn't just become like that. <laughs> It takes food to grow from an infant to an adult. It takes spiritual food to grow into the life of Christ. Mm. Amen. Amen. But it takes more than food to grow a holistic life. Why? Because the food you and me eat can only grow our body organs. Our emotional well-being, our intellectual well-being is grown by friends and family and the society. So today, I want to share with us, what does it take to grow into the life of Christ? Number one, I want to share with you a number of scriptures that emphasize the importance of growth. The book of Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 11 to 15. Ephesians chapter 4 verse 11 to 15. Ephesians chapter 4 verse 11 to 15. Listen to what Paul is saying. Ephesians chapter 4 verses 11 to 15. Paul is talking about the gifts of the Holy Spirit. They some of you have been appointed to be prophets. Go to verse 14. Then we will no longer be infants tossed back and forth by the waves that blown here and there by every wind teaching. In verse 15, instead, speaking the truth in love, we will in all things grow up into Christ who is the head. Paul is saying that when we have received the gifts of the Holy Spirit, their purpose is to do what? Grow us into who? Into Christ. Hmm. In Colossians chapter 2 and verse 6 and 7, Paul says, Just as you received Christ Jesus as Lord, do what? Continue in Him, rooted and strengthened up. So Paul is saying, it is a good thing to begin with Christ, but you must also do what? Grow in Christ. First Peter. First Peter chapter 3. Sorry, 2 Peter, chapter 3 and verse 18. Grow in the knowledge and grace of our Lord and Savior who? We find Hebrews chapter 5 
and verse 12 just to make the case for growth Hebrews chapter 5 this is Paul's sadness with the Hebrew believers he says to them we have much to say about this Hebrews chapter 5 verses 11 to 14 but it is hard to explain because you are slow to learn in fact though by this time you ought to be teachers you need someone to teach you the elementary truth of God's word all over again you need milk not solid food anyone who lives on milk being still an infant is not acquainted with the teachings about righteousness but solid food is for who? the mature who constantly grow if you do not grow the life that you receive through the Holy Spirit you cannot be able to mature and in 1 Corinthians chapter 3 verses 1 to 3 Paul says I can only treat you as infants the reason why there is division between you is because none of you has grown from being infants you still think like children if we do not grow we remain children the question is what does it take to grow into the life of Jesus Christ I want to put it to you that the availability of food is no guarantee of growth and good health is that a correct statement yes, yes. I live in a community where food is in plenty but sickness and unhealthiness is also equally in plenty the fact that food is there is no guarantee that you will be alive and you will be maturing in order for food to be able to help you grow it must be part of you so the first thing is that you must learn how to consume the food but the second other important reason that in order for food to be able to grow you into a healthy person three things you need to know about number one what food you eat will determine what health you have Point number two, how you eat your food will also determine the benefits that that food gives you. And point number three, when you eat that food. It isn't just the food you eat. It is also how you eat that food and when you eat that food. Your health is shaped by that. And that is why as Adventists, I want to believe God has given us a health message. Why? Because God's desire is that as we live in this world, we will not only prosper spiritually, but also prosper in our what? In our health. And we prosper in our health by knowing and accepting the things that make for health. If you want to enjoy good health, there is enough information out there that makes your health be enjoyable. And I want to put it to you that number one, food in order to give us the best returns. As Adventists we say, nutritionists tell us that if you want to gain the most from every food you eat, eat that food in its most as natural state as possible. So let me illustrate. I was going to ask David to bring me some corn, but I wasn't able to get through. But let me ask you the question. I have three examples here. One of them you can see it only by your mind. It is not here. The first example is corn. You know corn? Yes. Those of us from Africa, maize. Yes. We call it maize where we are. Most of us call it corn. So I want you to picture with me corn. Number one. And I was able to get from my hotel some cornflakes. You know cornflakes for breakfast? Mm -hmm. And they also gave me some corn-fed chicken. So you can see that. Okay? If you eat corn, cornmeal, cornflakes, corn-fed chicken, what gives your body the best returns? Why? Because it has not been processed. It has all the ingredients. Stick with me, I'm going. But if you want to gain the most, 
you must learn what it means to eat the word in its most direct form. I know as Adventists we love our Sabbath school lessons. But remember, the Sabbath school lesson is not the Bible. Oh yes. Oh yes. The Sabbath school lesson is a guide to the Bible. If you want to gain the most, learn and discipline yourself to eat right from the world. Amen. Amen. Learn to get this word to speak to you directly. Learn to open scripture for yourself. It is okay for a pastor to be the means by which God speaks to you. But let me tell you something great. If you know how to hear God speaking to you straight from the word, then your spiritual growth is going to have quality in it that it cannot be given by any other word. Jesus said in John chapter 5 verse 39, You search the scriptures because you think in them they have what? Eternal life. It is they that testify of me, yet you do what? You refuse to come to me. It is when we search the scriptures that we position ourselves where the Holy Spirit can take the very life of Christ and make it our own. There is a place for the Sabbath school lesson and all the other Bible guides, but I consider that as the place for the infant. Because I remember when we were growing up, the food had to be made simple. You know, we grew up in the time when we didn't have all this new technology. So mothers were very accustomed to when their baby is growing up to just take a banana or a potato, put it in the mouth, chew it, take it from the mouth and give it to the baby. <laughs> we survived, isn't it? Yes, yes. But when you have grown up, do you continue eating food like that? No. 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 One sign of maturity is that you can be able to eat for yourself. And let me tell you, we have no excuse. Our parents could have an excuse. They were not as vast as informed. But you and me have the word. We have the word in our very languages. The tragedy of our days is this. Many of us have the word, yet we do not eat from the word. You want to grow a healthy, spiritual, Christian discipleship, discipline yourself to spend the time with the world. Question number two, it is okay to have the food and you could have the right food, but how you eat that food will also determine whether it gives you the health that you need. Notice, in order for you to gain the most from the food, we are encouraged by the experts, <clears throat> learn to eat your food with your mouth, with your eyes, and with your mind. What do I mean by that? I mean that when you are enjoying your food, learn to remove distractions. Let me admit, I have tried to fight that battle in my house, and I am not winning the battle. Our generation today, especially in the West, we live with a generation that is always on technology. You know these iPads, the computers, the TV and the phone, for many of us, instead of being a blessing, they have become a curse. In what way? That we can't live without that thing. So I have this fight in my house with my girls. Every time they are eating, the TV has to be on, there must be a program. So somebody is trying to eat and they are trying to do something else. And you know many of us try to do that in life. Let me tell you, a recipe for poor health is learning to eat doing other things. Number one, you risk overeating because your mind is not where? There. Yes. Some people's problem of obesity is not that they are eating the wrong food. They're eating that right food in the wrong way. And scripture is very clear that we must learn to eat God's word without destruction. When you look at the life of Jesus Christ, I want to give you two verses. If you read the life of Jesus Christ in the book of Luke, chapter 5 and verse 16, Jesus would rise up early in the morning and leave the house and go to a secluded place to be with to spend quality time alone with God.
God's word. Learn to go away from the distraction and the noise. There is a place for family worship. And let me tell you, I usually tell my wife, I love you, my wife. You know, you've been a blessing to my life. We are one in many things, but there are things that we are not one. And one of them is food. You, I can't eat for you and you can't eat for me. That is something you have to do for yourself. Your family cannot eat for you your spiritual life. We must know in our life what it means to set aside time alone with God's word. And distracted time where we give ourselves only to God. And God is waiting to do that for you. Isaiah 50 and verse 4. This is one promise of the Bible I have often claimed. And I want to spend my time with my God. Isaiah 50 and verse 4. Isaiah 50 and verse 4. This is what the prophet Isaiah says. And it is a promise that is available for each of us. Isaiah 50 verse 4 tells us. The sovereign Lord has given me an instructed tongue. To know the word that sustains the weary. He wakens me when? Morning by morning. Wakens my ear to listen like one being what? Paul. God is ready to wake you up in the morning in order to speak to you through his word. And the reason why he wants to do that is because he knows when you spend time with God's word, you will grow into the likeness of Christ. So it is important, number one, we learn to eat the right food. We know what it means to study the actual word other than the explained word. Point number two, it is important that we learn how to eat that word. We learn to eat that word in a distracted manner, without other noises around us. For then will our ear be open to hear you. It is because of Isaiah's experience with the Lord that we come across where he narrates to us is Isaiah, you know, the prophet Elijah. Remember the prophet Elijah on the mountain? Yes. And there was a great noise, and in that noise, there was a thunder. Was the Lord in the thunder? No. There was a great lightning. Was the Lord in the lightning? No. no. The Lord was in a what? A small, still voice. Many of us do not know the experience of being still, of listening to that voice of God. You can only hear it if you know what it means to be quiet, if you know what it means to be silent. And I want to encourage you, learn in your life to refuse your life to be run by other people through the phone or through anything else. I usually tell my family, you know, when I'm having my meal, even if the phone rings, I don't take it. Because I have tried a number of times just before I started my meal and the phone, the, the phone ran and I took it and I was not even able to eat that food because you have to attend an emergency. I have a principle when I have to do certain priorities, those who have to die, let them die. I will bury them when I have finished my priorities. <laughs> there must be things in your life that are more important than other people and that is God. Mm. And spending that time alone with God must be so important that nobody or anything else takes it away from you. You have quiet time alone with God. Amen. Learn to eat the word and distract it. I want to add another point to that. In order for you to gain the most out of that word, eat that word at the right time. What is the right time? Let me ask you. What is the right time to have your best meal? In the morning or lunch or the evening? Morning. Do all of you eat like that? No. Now where I come from, I know that in the morning you have a little drink. Lunch time you have something slightly. And then in the evening that's when you have the big meal. And what happens when you go to sleep? You spend the whole night standing from right and left. But the fact be told, the best meal or to be the morning. We say, eat your breakfast like a king. king. Your lunch like a prince. A prince. prince. And your supper like a pauper. A poor person. I want you to take that Say, When do you need Christ most? 
just before you begin the battles of the day or just when you end the battles of the day? Before you begin. And if you want to gain the most from the word, organize your life in such a way that you start your day with an audience with Christ. When you discipline yourself, when you train yourself to begin your day with the Lord, then it positions you where you must go. So I want to challenge you that the life of Christ does not just become our life. It becomes our life because we take certain steps to assimilate that life in our life. We take the steps of a devotional life. So I want to say to you today, spending time alone with God in order to develop and continue a relationship with God is not something you do in addition to being a Christian. It is not something you do as an adult to your discipleship. That is the way you become and continue and remain as a disciple. Without it, there is no discipleship. As I said, you can receive the best life of your parents. But if you do not play your part to put in that life, the ingredients that are essential to prosper that life, however good it is, it is a waste. Likewise, the life we receive from Jesus must be grown and nurtured through his word, through prayer, through his spirit. But there is also a second dimension that I want to bring to our light. The food we eat will grow our body organs. That's why there is this saying, show me your food and I will show you the quality of your health. Show me your friends and I will show you your what? You your character. The food we eat can only grow your body organs. It takes people, especially your family, your friends, and even your force to grow your emotional well-being. Let me illustrate. If you grow in a home where people are very affectionate, you know, dad is kissing mom, you know, everybody is hugging everybody else, what do you tend to be? A very affectionate, the same kind of person, isn't it? If you grow in a home where people are very reserved, you know, I grew up in a home, I've never heard my father saying to my mother, I love you. I know they love one another, but they never expressed it. <laughs> in fact, the first time my mother hugged me is when I graduated in Baraton. I almost had a heart attack. <laughs> I had not grown with a mother. You know, parents who hugged you, no. You knew they loved you, they did everything for you, but they never said it. So when I was coming down and my mother was hugging me, I stood for a moment, I was wondering, what is she up to? <laughs> Your emotional well-being is not developed by food. It is developed by friends. It is developed by family. It is developed by force. That's why in the New Testament, if there wasn't a Barnabas, patient Barnabas, we wouldn't have had a Paul. Did you know that? Because when Paul tried to join the church, what did they say to him? We don't want anything to do with you. You've been persecuted. It took Barnabas to introduce Paul to who? To the church. And the same Paul was very hard to learn because when John Mark decided that the going was too hard and he couldn't keep it and he turned away and then he pleaded with Paul to join the second missionary journey. Did Paul accept it? Paul said no. Who, did, who helped Mark? Barnabas. It is Barnabas who helped Mark. You remember two disciples of Christ, John and James? Jesus gave them what name? Sons of Thunder. They went to Samaria and asked for Samaritans to accommodate Jesus and they refused and they were so incensed. They came to Jesus and said, Jesus, give us the power to bring fire from heaven and do what? And burn them. Jesus looked at them and said, you do not know what spirit you have. Not long after that, Jesus is heading to Jerusalem. He will establish his kingdom. 
They cannot approach Jesus by themselves, so they go through their mother. And the mother comes and says, Lord, is it possible to have some favor, to do me a favor about my sons? And when the others heard what John and James asked, what does the Bible say? They were angry. They were angry. And what changed them? Other disciples. That is why I want to say to you, if you only read your Bible and pray, and never fellowship, you cannot grow as a holistic disciple. The book of Acts chapter 2. Look at the early church. The early church discovered what it takes to grow the life of Christ in a holistic manner. Acts chapter 2 and verse 42 through 46. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and also to the what? To the fellowship. It is fellowship that enabled the disciples to be of one accord. It is fellowship that allowed them to be able to change. Fellowship provided an opportunity for learning from those who are mature. That is why Paul in Hebrews chapter 10 verse 25 says what? Do not neglect the gathering of the saints as is the habit of some. Because when we gather together, we grow one another. Amen. And our sister said it in our class. As iron sharpens iron, one man sharpens another. Mm, mm, mm. One woman sharpens another. One disciple sharpens another. That is why the Bible is very clear. It is only as we fellowship with other disciples that our actions and reactions are matured by others. And church, there are people in the church today who are physically mature, academically mature, intellectually mature, but emotionally immature. Do you know there are people in the world today who run multi-million companies. They employ millions of people, but they can't be able to have a relationship with other people. They have not been able to develop emotionally. They don't know how to respond to love. They don't know how to deal with anger. They don't know how to deal with, you know, bitterness. That is not something you will be developed in a school. That is something you learn from others. That is why Jesus said, a new commandment I give to you. Do what? Love one another. The way you express love to God is by looking for a brother and sister and engaging in love with them. And I want to put it to us that without fellowship, we cannot be able to experience what Paul says, Paul says in, the, in his many writings, love one another, bear one another's burden, pray for one another, encourage one another. How can you do one another with people if you're not fellowshipping with them? You can't. That is why to grow in a holistic way, we must know what it means to spend time with other brethren. And the fellowship that allows you and me to grow has three key ingredients in it. Number one, we must learn what it means to come together and meet with other brethren. Some of us, our lives are so busy, so self-centered, we have no time to meet with other people. You cannot fellowship by remote control. You cannot fellowship by telephone. Fellowship that is biblical and designed for growing is a fellowship that requires us to be one to one with another person. That's the first ingredient. Ingredient number two. Fellowship that will allow you to grow as a disciple is one where we know what it means to share and care for one another. Galatians chapter 6 and verse 1 and 2 Paul says, Bear one another's burden because in doing so, you fulfill the law of Christ's love. It is a great thing to come together. But let me tell you, church, sometimes we come together and leave church with the same burden. Why? Because we do not have time to care and share for one another. class. 
what we encourage every class to do is when you meet together as a summer school class and you want to employ every class, do not have more than four members in your class. Mm -hmm. When you meet, spend the first seven to eight minutes sharing and caring for one another. Amen. Amen. Find out what has happened to the, to the other members along the week. Mm. Pray for them, support them. Mm. That's what fellowship is about. Sometimes we come to church and the devil has battered us throughout the whole week. We are looking for somebody to lift us up. We are looking for somebody to encourage us. And our program of the church can be so regimented that we have no time to share and care for another. Mm. Mm. We must create in our church and in our coming together an opportunity to care and share. Some of us have full built walls around ourselves. We do not allow you to come. We say you can only come, but not this far. We carry our burdens. Church, remember Jesus, who was God. When he came and dwelt among his disciples, Jesus was not ashamed to share his innermost burdens. In the Garden of Gethsemane, he told his disciples, My soul is burdened. He shared his innermost pain and sadness. And many of us cannot do that. We can never fully flourish unless we do that. In gradient number three, we must learn what it means to encourage, to build, and to strengthen each other. When we come to church, we come to church and fellowship in order to lift up the struggling brother and sister, in order to encourage the one who is being battled. It is when we do those things that we become holistic, maturing disciples. But finally, 2 Timothy chapter 5, chapter 5, chapter 3, verse 16 and 17. It takes food to grow your body. It takes friends and family and foes to grow your heart. What does it take to grow your mind? It takes society. Both formal and informal. That's why many of us spend a lot of time in school. Many years that we need to spend in school. And some of us are still learning even when we are supposed to be retiring. We are always learning. Why? Because society and the community around exposes us to information. Second Corinthians, Second Timothy, Paul says, All scripture is inspired of God and is profitable for what? Doctrine. What is doctrine? Doctrine is the teachings of and about. Behind the actions of Jesus is the person of Jesus. Behind the, uh, the gifts of the Holy Spirit is the person of the Holy Spirit. Doctrine is like a theological exercise where we begin to look behind the action of the person to the person himself. Who is God like? And that is why we say it is only as we familiarize with the fundamental doctrines of scripture that we begin to grow as disciples intellectually. And doctrine is not just the exercise of an individual, it is the collective exercise of the church. That is why I want to challenge you. Do not be satisfied, as Paul says, with the basic teachings of salvation. Paul says, as a mature person, you need to go to the deeper things. You need to go to the meat of the stuff. That's why when you read about the sanctuary, don't just be satisfied to know that the sanctuary was about the salvation, the forgiveness of sin. What message did the sanctuary bring us? The sanctuary opened our eyes to begin to see the extent of the problem of sin and how God will ultimately solve it. So don't be satisfied with the sea at its shallowest. Learn to discover the beauty of the deeper parts of the sea. Don't be satisfied with knowing just John 3.16. Some of us only read, you know, the Gospels. We are scared of reading Romans and Hebrews. And we are not alone. Do you know there are Christian denominations that don't read the book of Revelation and Daniel? It's scary to them. They are just satisfied.
people who want to go want to go to school from class one to four. You tell them to go to secondary and university. No, that is too high the stuff for us. Doctrine is what grows us intellectually. It allows us to see the bigger things of God. And that's why I want to say to you, learn to be always involved in asking questions. I know in the Adventist church sometimes there are some questions that we ask and they create more trouble than solutions. <laughs> and this quarter is not going to be an easy quarter. Some of us are experts in trying to bring discussions on things that are not even part of the lesson. Oh yes, oh yes. <laughs> we struggle, you can find a big debate about the stone and we forget the bigger things all around. Ooh. No, I said don't be threatened, don't be scared about those questions. Ask them, but ask them with a genuine desire mm. to know and see how they can benefit. Because that's the only way you grow. Mm. Unless you grow the life of Christ through the study of scripture, through prayer, through fellowship, and through familiarization with the doctrines, you can never be able to be a mature disciple. Remember, in life, without growth, there is only one sure end. And what is that end? Death. In discipleship, if you do not adopt the disciplines that allow you to grow in the life of Christ, then all you are waiting for is to die as a disciple. I pray and challenge you today. Commit yourself. Take on board the disciplines that bring about growth. Spending time alone with God. In prayer, in the study of His Word. Listening to the voice of the Spirit. Take the life of Christ and make it your life. Learn and, and, and be able to sacrifice in order to be together with the brethren where you can share what God is revealing to you and you can listen what God is revealing to the others so that you grow in a holistic way. But more, more than that, learn to dig into the deeper things of God, into the very deep oceans of God's word. Some of us know this song. We consider it a children's song. But I want to tell you, the words of that song are practical in a disciple who does not grow. You know that song? Read your Bible, pray every day. Read your Bible, pray every day. Pray every day. But if you read your Bible consistently, if you pray always, if you fellowship with others, you will grow. I like the words of song number 500. I like the way the author has put it. He says, take time to be holy. Let me just read the words for that song for you. Take time to be holy. Speak often with the Lord. Abide in Him always and feed on His word. Take time to be holy. The world rushes on. Spend much time in secret with Jesus alone. By looking to Jesus like him thou shalt be. Thy friends in thy conduct. His likeness shall be. Let us stand together and see the first stanza and the second stanza of that song.